Well, good morning, everyone. I was, I was telling our guest today that she was remarking on this view, and those of you who've been here before know that I always talk about this view because invariably it's too sunny and so we have to have the shades drawn and nobody can see. One of the big reasons we built this building here is this view, so what a great day. It's a little cold for me for almost May. I wanna be in flip-flops at this time. Um, this is the last uh, leadership forum. I was, telling, I was telling Pat that this is a new initiative by, by the business school where all the programming on Fridays is dedicated to, to career development. I think it's been a great first year. Of course, this is not the last Focus Friday. This is the last uh, leadership forum. And it's a, it's a special treat for me. This was all made possible today by a, a former student, Tim Fenton, who's sitting here. I'm gonna introduce Tim and embarrass him for a little bit, and then he's gonna introduce our guest. But Tim was one of you uh, a few years ago. When did you graduate, Tim? 14, so just a couple of years ago, and he was on the business council. And Tim and the business center at the time, Scott Marsden, really pushed uh, us to develop more and offer more career development opportunities. In fact, it's because of Tim and Scott that we first started our, our career exploration trips that some of you may have gone on. Uh, we had two or three when Tim was here. Now we have, I think, 15 or so. Um, and none of this was, was here including this building. Um, Tim's now an analyst at, at Goldman Sachs, and Tim, why don't you come up here and introduce our guest. Thanks for everything you've done. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Um, so yeah, as Dave said, my name's Tim Fenton, um, and I'm here to introduce uh, Pat. I wanted to talk just briefly about Aggie Network. Um, that's why I'm here, so. I started an organization after I graduated called Aggie Network, and, and the goal of the program is to, it's tailored specifically to Huntsman School Business students, and the goal is to help you transition from your academic career um, to a professional career. And so what we do is we connect you with a recent graduate who's working in the area that you know, you're interested in, and then um, you kind of work with them one-on-one -on -one to you know, get the inside scoop on how to transition into um, your career. So. Um, we, have, we have graduates, right now we're in industries in investment banking, consulting, uh, private equity, uh, corporate finance, um, finance, we have operations. Um, we also have graduates who are studying and working internationally. So if that's something that's interesting, for, uh, interesting to you, we can, we can help with that too. So I think we pass around flyers, there's information. Uh, to get more information about the program or apply, um, the website is youraggynetwork.com or y-o-u-r aggynetwork.com. So um, yeah, I just wanted to explain that to you. Um, now I'll introduce our speaker. We're really excited to have Patricia Jones here. Um, she is the CEO of the Women's Leadership Institute. And the mission of the Women's Leadership Institute is to elevate the stature of female leadership in the state of Utah. Um, she served in the Utah leg legislature for 14 years, holding various leadership positions for 12 of the, those years, and she was the first female leader in either party of the, ho or the, ho of the House of the Legislature. Um, she graduated from Utah, University of Utah, magna cum laude. Um, she currently serves on the Utah Board of Regents, the Board of Governors of the Salt Lake Chamber, Zion's Bank Board, the Intermountain Health Care Community Care Foundation, Dominion Questar Advisory Board, Prosperity 2020 Co-Chair, and on the National Advisory Board of the University of Utah School of Dentistry. Um, Pat has many interests, including exercising, biking, skiing, playing pickleball, tennis, watching sports, especially basketball and football, reading, politics, cooking, having fun with her children and grandchildren, and traveling. Um, her least favorite thing to do is wait in long lines. I can get behind that. Uh, Patricia is married to Dr. Dan E. Jones, uh, 41 years, and has four children, three stepchildren, and 16 grandchildren. So please join me in welcoming Patricia Jones. I, I guess hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me with this lab mic? Oh, this is wonderful to be here with all of you today. I'm going to go up here so I can advance my slides. Um, Utah State has a very special meaning for me because we did live up here for several years. And so coming back here is always kind of renewal for me. 
uh, to see the beautiful buildings. And I don't think there's a, a prettier spot on earth than, than Logan, especially this time of year, right? When the, the, all of the beautiful snow is left, most of it has. So uh, what a great pleasure it is to be here with you today and talk to you students and address the faculty and staff, whoever's here. Uh, I am here to talk to you about women's leadership, but this is not just for women. Uh, and I will explain that a little bit more. The importance of having men involved in women's leadership and women mentoring men and men mentoring women is really a critical part of elevating the stature of women's leadership. So let me take you on a little journey today. Um, I'm not sure who to, where to click this, but I don't know. Someone can help me with that. OK. <laughs> There's always a technical bug. Um, the Women's Leadership Institute began just two years ago, and it was kind of a convergence for me uh, between the political realm and the business realm. And I know that there are many people in this audience who are in business or are anticipating going into business. But, but can't you just feel the kind of the renewed energy of having women in politics and in business today? I can tell you that we are getting a lot of inquiries from many of the businesses in our state about you know, how do we find more women who we can put on our boards and so forth. So I'm going to start uh, this morning with looking at some pictures of some animals and creatures in our environment. And I like to use this projective exercise sometimes in some of the focus groups that I do um, to ask you how do you think that organizations today view women's leadership? Would you say they're more like a giraffe where they can kind of see the vision and can stand above the trees and kind of see where this is all going? Or do you see them maybe as, as a horse, you know, leading the way, running ahead, really moving ahead? Or do you think that there are many organizations that look at women's leadership as kind of black widows, something you don't want to touch or feel you want to stay away from? So I have been doing a lot of, of studying uh, from research from a woman by the name of Barbara Annis. Barbara Annis is a gender intelligence specialist. And she studies the physiological differences between men's and women's brains. And in fact, she is going to be our keynote speaker in just a few weeks uh, coming here to explain how we can leverage those differences. But I'm going to give you the end of her book. I'm going to give you the summary of what she's finding. Because I have yet to find, when I speak to groups like this, uh, men who disagree with this and women who are surprised by this. So let me start by this. I'll tell you a little story that happened to me. Um, I go into a lot of the different businesses in Utah and helping them understand why it's important to include women and to elevate women in senior management and the benefits of doing so. And just recently, I was asked to go uh, and speak at one of the large construction companies. It was a company in Utah County. And uh, the, the president and CEO asked me to come down and, and explain this to his executive team. I drove up, it was in, in Orem, early in the morning. And the whole parking lot was filled with you know, gun racks and you know, trucks and things like that. And I knew that I had a challenge in front of me. And so uh, in fact, I went in there and uh, you know, talking to uh, nine men in a group and explaining to them why it will benefit them if they consider more women in executive levels in their company. And frankly, they were trying to find them, but were having difficulty, which is something we often hear. And so I started to explain to them why it would help them. And they were completely disengaged, you know, reading their phones and just kind of laying back and probably wondering how long is this going to take and when can I go to lunch and so forth. And so I kind of mentally put that aside and changed the whole direction of what I told them. And what I told them was what I had been reading from Barbara Annis and her research. And that was this. I said to them, I'll bet you are really confused about the rules today on how to work with women. You don't know what to call women. 
You don't know if you should open a door for a woman. You don't know if you can compliment her on her dress. You fear that you might be, uh, have some uh, sexual um, allegations against them or you know, say the wrong thing to a woman. You don't know, really know what to say to them, how they'll take it. And you don't know if you should go to lunch with a woman alone and you're talking about business. You don't know if you want to invite a woman in your office to go golfing with the rest of the men in the group. It's really uncomfortable today for men in the workplace and how to deal with women. And what happens is that, that men back away and don't engage because it's safer to do that. Well, what women do is they read that to mean I don't matter, I don't care, or they don't care about me, they don't really care about my needs, and so forth. So what is happening today is what we're trying to do with Barbara Addis and people like her is to help us understand where opposite genders are on this whole issue of integrating women into the workplace. And we're finding that those kinds of feelings are valid. That's how many, many men feel about it, working with women. And it's helpful for women to understand that so that we can work together and leverage those differences and make our workplaces great, make our communities better. Because as you know, there are some differences in the way that men and women think. And we're going to discuss those quickly today. Uh, so today, um, I would like to talk to you about the uh, tapping into the gold mine. Tapping into the gold mine, I'm gonna come down here because I can't see, um, of, of women in business, women, in, women leaders. This was a study that was done by Jack Zanger of Zanger Folkman. And Zanger Folkman is a very well-known company. They're based in Utah County. Um, Jack Zanger is on my board, and he has given me permission to use these data. But they did a, this very large survey uh, internationally of businesses and business leaders. And they uh, wanted to find out some perceived differences in working with men and women from these leaders. You can see it was a very large sample, 7,280 people that they interviewed. And they asked them some questions about who do they think is more effective at each of the tasks, men or women. So I'm gonna ask you, who do you think is better, men or women, at developing strategic perspective? Anyone? Go ahead, say it. <laughs> this one is men. Okay, men were rated higher than women on strategic perspectives. Technical or professional expertise, both men and women were rated equally there. Connecting the group to the outside world, men and women. Communicating powerfully and prolifically, women. Innovating, women. Solving problems and analyzing issues, women. Collaboration and teamwork, women. Um, there's more. Establishing stretch goals, women. Using a clicker, women. <laughs> Inspiring and motivating others. I'm not sure where this should be clicked. <laughs> anyway, women. Does anybody? <laughs> Okay, please. Thank you. Oh, there it went. So I must be good in a good spot right here. Uh, building relationships, women. I'll just click through. That's fine. I can do that. That's okay. Just can't see it very well. Uh, developing others, women. Uh, practicing self development, women. Displaying high integrity and honesty, women. And displaying high integrity and honesty as women. So you can see that on those very large group of you know, men and women and on those particular factors, that women really score higher in almost every category when you compare men and women together. And so, uh, this isn't working either. <laughs> okay, taking initiative, there's one more, uh, women. So the current situation right now in, in America, in the US, is that women make up more than half of the workforce 
And as you move up the organization, there are fewer women. You can see on this slide, again, this is from the Zenger Folkman group, that as you move, only 3% of the CEOs in our nation is comprised of women. And yet, when you look at new hires, you see more women going into the workplace, but fewer women going and, in, and elevating up toward management. Now, why is this an important issue? The reason why this is an important issue is because there's huge, broader national economic interests. Uh, since the 1970, 26% of the growth in GDP has come from more women in the workforce. And of course, there are organizational interests. We see this every day uh, with so many organizations. Uh, most of them are led by men, and they're seeing that they need strong leadership, and they're tr starting to understand uh, why this is important. And so we are sitting on an untapped resource, women. Uh, they currently pirate from each other or make big investments in recruiting and development. So you're seeing that in, you know, stealing other people's um, talent in other people's company. And then, of course, there's always the moral reasons of fairness and equality. Now, females were rated as more effective than males at most levels. So top managers, that is a huge gap. You have 51.8 versus 60.5. So once women do get those opportunities and move up, they do really well. Gender ratios and effectiveness by function. I love this slide because it shows you how many men versus women are in these various kinds of occupations and industries. In sales, 76% of people in sales are male in our nation. And yet, when you look at how men and women are rated in sales, females are rated much more effective than males. In fact, there were only three where males were rated a little bit better, and that was in customer service, facilities management, maintenance, and administrative and clerical. Now, I am not here to bash men, okay? I am here to help men understand the value of having gender diversity in the workplace. And, uh, and how important it is for men to be part of that and to understand that. So there's a saying out there that, and a, a sense that, is it bad for women to be promoted? How many times have we heard that, where we have heard that women are not popular when they are promoted to senior management and so forth? So, in fact, Zanger Folkman did some studies on this, and they measured likability. And again, these were people who had worked with men and women throughout a long course in their careers. And the likability index items that they measured on were these, stays in touch with issues and concerns, balances getting results with a concern for others' needs, is trusted by all members of the work group, promotes a high level of cooperation between all members of the work group, is a role model and sets a good example, gives honest feedback in a helpful way, is truly concerned, and so forth. So what happened with that? How do females and males measure up when it comes to likability at the organizational level? This is what's really fascinating, is you have females in the red. Now, all both men and women drop a little bit after they become supervisors. My theory is that you will rate someone better because you know them better at the supervisor level. But you can see that women tend to maintain that likability throughout the course of, of their advancement. But men tend to drop a little bit more than women do in terms of likability. So that has been debunked by this study. And uh, so there is a significant shift. So what are the solutions that we can look at? And I think I absolutely agree with Zanger Folkman on this. First of all, society needs to change. That is something that will take longer. Organizations also need to change. I can tell you that that is happening now. There are many organizations, and we're getting a lot of tech companies in particular coming into Utah, and they are just looking you know, at the landscape here and uh, seeing great opportunities in Utah. And so uh, the organizations are absolutely changing because they have to. Uh, the market forces and the labor shortage is as imperative that they do that. And then finally, women accelerate the change as they enlarge their self-image. 
this lack of confidence is so um, prevalent today. Uh, you'll see it in men and women, but in particular women oftentimes lack the confidence. They never think that they would be the CEO one day. They never think that they'll run for political office. Uh, so they just need to be encouraged. And men are so important as part of the mentoring uh, part of that. So I mentioned the physiological difference between men's and women's brains. And looking at a lot of the research that uh, Barbara has done and a lot of other researchers have done, that men, you know, this is the same house, but you can see that a man's brain is oftentimes, um, there, it's like a, a house full of rooms where the doors are closed off. Men are, w are able to kind of close things off and women's doors are open all of the time. In fact, the research shows that a woman's brain works 24 seven and a man's brain can be turned off at times. And I don't think that's any surprise to any woman that's tried to talk to a man during a football game. So, um, and as she says, it's neither better nor worse, it's just different. And we need to get to a place where we appreciate and respect our different talents. So what happens uh, when you go into a meeting to take a seat? I loved this example that, um, that was in Barbara Annis's book. Because what she, she asked men of hundreds of men and women across the nation, tell me if you wanted to go into a meeting and sit down, what would you do? And the most common answer that a man gave was, well, I go in, I find a seat, and I sit down. A woman goes into a room, and the woman said, or says, I go in, I kind of look at the room, I see who's in there, I kind of can get an idea who they're thinking or what they're thinking, I can see their body language, I can kind of get an idea of you know, what color shirt they're wearing. A woman can immediately f figure that out very quickly, it's very different, whereas a man focuses, and again, these are generalizations, it's not true of everybody, but it was uh, quite interesting that how differently, and we both assume that the other gender can see it the way we do, but this is an advantage of having more women in decision making, is having those different kinds of thought processes. I mentioned the Women's Leadership Institute was started just over two years ago. Uh, it was the idea and the vision of uh, some of our top business leaders in Utah. And when they approached me, I was given this mission, more women in politics, more women elevated in senior level positions within organizations and on corporate boards. And they just basically said, have fun with that, figure it out. What was happening is, and it's still there, there's a perception outside of Utah that, that Utah is not a great place for women. It is, an, I, in my opinion, an unfair perception, an inaccurate perception but there are some things that we need to improve on. And, and, and business is realizing that. This is a huge, this is not just a trend, this is a huge movement. Um, what makes the Women's Leadership Institute unique? Number one, we're business led. We are housed in the, in the chamber. We work with organizations all over the state of Utah and outside of Utah. Uh, we just recently started the WLI and the Elevate Her Challenge in St. George. And the next stop will be Logan, Utah. That's where we're coming next. And so we're excited about that. Your new president, Noelle Cockett, is very engaged in what we're doing. So business-led, uh, just about three years ago, we had our first launch of the Women's Leadership Institute. The second thing that makes us unique is we consider men as allies and advocates of women. This is the most important thing that I can say. A lot of the women's organizations become men bashers, frankly, some of them. And they don't engage men. And men are critical to the success of getting women elevated because we can work together and we can leverage our talents and work together and make things so much better. Um, we have many, many women who have had mentors who are men. And it seems like the magical time when men tend to understand this is when they have daughters. They have daughters and they start thinking about their daughter's futures. But I can tell you I've had many uh, wonderful men who have mentored me and there are often times when women mentor men. You can see here Scott Anderson here on the lower picture here on the right. He, it was really his vision. He's the president and CEO of Zions Bank. You probably have heard of him. 
he's probably one of the most respected business leaders in our whole region, not just in Utah. And this really was his vision. But I asked his wife, Jessely, who's also on the Board of Regents, who, who loves Utah State also, you know, what got him so interested in women's leadership? And she told me that he had, when he was a banker in San Francisco, had a marvelous woman who mentored him. And I just thought, that, that, you know, what a way to give back. The third thing that makes uh, the Women's Leadership Institute unique is that the tone is proactive. We really are not about quotas. We're about moving leadership forward. Um, and then the last thing is the Elevate Her Challenge, which is a corporate challenge that is designed to help organizations that give them the tools and the resources and the understanding of why it's important and how to move uh, women ahead, men and women. The elevator challenge is really consists of six different items, and this, these are all based on research that if you do them collectively, that your return on investment will, will be enhanced, your ability to attract and retain talent will be enhanced, and your employee morale will be enhanced. The first part of the elevator challenge is to increase the percentage of women in leader, senior leadership positions in your organization. Uh, increase the retention rate of women at all levels of your organization. Increase the number of women in your board and encourage women to serve on boards. Monitor pay by gender and close identified gaps. Establish a leadership development and a mentoring program to enhance existing programs. And recruit women to run for public office and give follow-up support. And then, you know, when we had our board, and our board is comprised of half men and half women, uh, and they have been so marvelous in helping us help guide the Women's Leadership Institute. They said, you know, some of them that, that serve and who are heads of some of the larger organizations in our state said, we're already doing most of these. Can we add a seventh one? And that would be to create your own innovative ways to elevate women in your organization. So when I say that the Women's Leadership Institute is business-led, I literally mean it. They are guiding what we're doing. I wanted to talk about the public office piece of it. And some people say, why do, we, why do you care about if a woman runs for public office? Well, I think this Bagley cartoon says it well. Uh, I don't know if you can read it, but the committee to investigate why Utah is the worst state in the nation for women will now come to order. And uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, we laugh at that. We think that's uh, not quite funny, but just that same year, I was asked to go to Provo City Council to present the Women's Leadership Institute, and somebody took this picture while I was presenting the Women's Leadership Institute to their council. And I thought, you know, it doesn't look too different <laughs> than that, does it? So I had to for sure get a picture of that. Um, and then, of course, just recently, you know, this was uh, Vice President Pence presenting our nation's health care to members of Congress. And I just thought it was striking that you don't see, you, they, they look similar. Do they look similar to you? Uh, these people are uh, discussing some of, one of the most important issues that um, all of us as Americans face. We need some more women in here that can be at the table, that can bring their perspectives to it. So I'm going to focus just a little bit on why women should run for office, and then I'll be glad to take your questions. You know, how often do you hear about the great things about running for office and serving in office? Doesn't, don't you think in today's environment that politics has such a negative connotation? And women tend to reject that. They t tend to shy away from that. When in fact, it's one of the most important things that we can do. Representative Becky Edwards, who represents um, Davis in Davis County in the State House, said to me once, you know, as women, we will stand in front of a train if we have to, to protect our kids. We will do that. I think the men would too. And yet we shy away from sitting at the table in helping prepare and be part of the most important decision making that we can make in education and healthcare and so forth. And I just thought that was a really good way to do it. So here today, I'm going to, and this can apply to men and women, why you should consider running for office. And let me just stop for a minute and say, address the, I'll call you the millennial crowd, okay? Younger people. 
Most older people like myself will not admit this, but I wish I were your age again. I love your generation. Your generation, I'm hopeful because of your generation. I love what you stand for. I love your values. And so I feel like our country's in good hands because of that. I'm glad you're where you are. I'm here to tell you why you should be involved and actually put your hat in the ring. If you're not quite ready for this now, please consider the following things and consider it at some point in the near future because we need the perspectives of women and we certainly need the perspectives of young people when we're making policy decisions. So I'm going to convince you about why you should run for office. The first one, and these are all from my own personal experiences, learn how government systems work. When I was in the House and Senate, I worked a lot on senior issues. Why? Because I live in Holiday, and Holiday is full of older people, okay? And so a lot of the work I did was a response to those, that, those things that, were, that seniors really cared about. So when my father became ill and needed long-term care, I wasn't quite sure where to go. But because I had worked with gerontologists on some legislation that I had been working on, I called them and asked them, where would you send your father if he needed long-term care? And they gave me great responses. I can go on and on with that, but at some point, especially women, will become caregivers, whether it's for their parents or their children or someone else. And it's really nice to know where you can go and how the system works and what resources are out there. Nothing does that better than serving in government and understanding that. Really critical that we know that. You form relationships with key influencers. This was uh, this one with uh, Governor Herbert. At our very first launch um, two years ago, we asked the governor to come speak, and he was the, he wasn't really didn't really know about the Women's Leadership Institute, but he heard these great speakers. He saw all of these organizations stand up and formally take the Elevate Her Challenge. So when he spoke, he says, "I'm taking the Elevator Challenge on behalf of the state of Utah." So, you know, we now have 160 organizations that have accepted, it, including Utah State University. You should be really proud of that. They have taken the Elevate Her Challenge, and. Um, and so you do get a chance to meet uh, people that you, know, you can rely on in the future. I have often said that serving in the, in the legislature for me was the equivalent of several graduate programs <laughs> because you're having to learn of, about budgets for education and healthcare and environmental issues and so forth. And it, it really helps you understand there are opportunities to travel. Um, you know, touring the dental school at the top. I have never, you know, regardless, it is such an educational experience. You learn all kinds of different things. Talking about building your confidence. Um, I'll tell you my very first speech on the floor of the house. This was in the year 2000, the very first week that I was there. It's intimidating, I have to say. Um, it's intimidating when you're in the legislature and you're, you know, see everybody seems to know what they're doing. It's kind of like the first day of junior high school. Actually, it's kind of like junior high school, yeah, the whole thing. Um, but I'll never forget this, that um, Representative Cheryl Allen, who represented Davis County at that time, and still, do, no, she's retired now, but uh, she was sponsoring a bill that would require licensure of estheticians. Okay, Utah at that time was the only state that did not require licensing estheticians. And so she did a beautiful speech in you know, proposing her bill and uh, one of the male legislators stood up, held up his fingernail clippers and said, you mean I need a license to use these? And I could feel the blood rush to my head. It's like, what? You know, and uh, he, uh, that was my first speech on the floor. And I said to them, to the group, I said, I'll bet very few of you have ever visited an esthetician, but here's what an esthetician does. They use very sharp tools, they use har harsh chemicals. And I you know, felt like I needed to educate them about what an esthetician does. But as I looked around the room, I was one of very, very few women there that could 
help educate on those kinds of issues. I could give you many, many examples, including um, committees where I was the only woman on the committee and they were discussing things about women, you know, gun issues too, um, health issues, that we need women's perspectives and we need more uh, diversity uh, among those that are making these very difficult decisions about how our state and our nation are going. Developing leadership skills is another thing. Um, I think this whole lack of confidence, especially among, among women, to give women opportunities to step in and to really develop those skills. You probably know the story of, of geese, and this is why I picked this picture. They usually fly in formation, and these geese were just taking off and getting ready to fly in that formation. But the head goose, you know, takes the hit, if you will, in that aerodynamics of flying. And so the geese follow because it's easier to follow in that line. And when that head goose gets tired, it pulls back and someone else pulls up to the front and takes the headwind. And that's how leadership is. Sometimes we're the leader and sometimes we're the follower. Uh, but learning those skills are essential. The other thing is honing critical skills. Now, I recently, in my previous life as a researcher, um, did a lot of focus groups. That was what I did and still do some of that. I did a, a research study on what employers are looking for in their incoming workforce and where they're having trouble finding, you know, what skills is there a huge gap in. And so this is information that might be useful to you right now. So you might want to take special attention, pay special attention here. There were four skills that we came up with that employers are really struggling finding right now. The first one is, the, is public speaking. The ability to speak to groups, so that oral communication, because right now what we're having is, is companies are, are working in teams now. You probably have noticed that. Goldman Sachs, you're at the lead of this. We've been partners with you. You go into Goldman Sachs right now, there's no cubicles. I mean, the engineers that used to hide in a cubicle and never used to have to talk to anybody, guess what engineers are doing nowadays? They're not just doing engineering, but they're speaking to the team. They're speaking to the board. They're speaking internationally. So no one is safe anymore. You have to be able to communicate orally uh, in today's world. It's a different world today. Um, the second one is problem solving. The ability to, to find solutions to problems is so huge. And guess what? All, these are all on steroids if you serve in public office. The third one is critical thinking, being able to think differently and creatively. This is something you'll hear a lot of talk about and something that employers are really having trouble finding. And then, of course, writing skills, the ability to write a, a cogent sentence in an email and, and so forth is really uh, difficult for our companies today. Um, finding and creating opportunities to serve on boards and engage with communities. My service in the legislature has opened up so many doors for me to, to engage with the community. Um, this bottom one, my, my little grandson's the only one without his Boy Scout uniform on. So anyway, I had to take that picture because then he learned. He needs to start wearing his Boy Scout uniform when he comes. But um, it's, so, it's so fun to see them. And then uh, enhance your decision-making skills. I, this car was in front of me, and I just couldn't help but think, why don't you just choose, Utah or BYU? I mean, you know, make a decision. You know, um, but it does. You have to decide. When you're running for office, you have to vote. You have to kind of weigh you know, the pros and cons of everything you do. It, it absolutely helps that. Uh, becoming a role model. Um, this one's, again, these are all p my personal stories. But this, um, the polka dot dress, my granddaughter, uh, she was the, she was the uh, student body president for her high school. And at graduation, when she spoke, she was on the Jumbotron and so forth at the, at the Delta Center. I still call it that name. And um, I said, Jen, I'm so proud of you. And she said, Grandma, you know why I ran? And then I realized she, was, she helped me on all five of my campaigns. She walked door to door with me. She was my, she was my m magician. You know, everybody loved her. And, uh, but I didn't realize at the time that I was a role model for her. And it took that 
little quip back from her for me to realize how important it is that women are in politics so that we can be role models for others. Uh, becoming a kinder, more patient person. When you're in office, you tend to realize that people around you uh, are your constituents and they're watching you. You tend to be a little bit nicer. You let people in. You're a better driver. You know, shouldn't we all run for office just for that? Um, and then learn to embrace challenges. Um, again, this is a personal story. My daughter and her two little, two of her two little kids, and you know, she's done all these marathons. She was in the Boston bombing. Um, she just ran Boston last week, uh, her third one. And I just think, you know, how difficult that is for, for people. But just challenges, learning to embrace challenges, to see opportunities, and to step into them for women. This one, I, I just love this picture. Again, I was waiting at a stoplight, and I just thought it was such an interesting picture. But learning to improvise, I do not know what these two people were doing. I think they were waiting for a bus. But, um, but they definitely were improvising, and you do. You have to be nimble and flexible. And then finding out who you are is so important. You know, going back to that one, uh, taking the path that is important to you. A lot of people grow older and just still trying to understand what they find meaning in their life and who they are. I will tell you, when you run for office, you are constantly asked, asking yourself, what are my values? What do I stand for? What's important to me? And it's the best place to learn that is when you're running for office. And then enhancing your career is another one. There are so many opportunities when you're in office. Learning the rules of civility. Wouldn't that be nice today to be able to work across the aisle so we can get things done in our nation? Uh, have a chance to make a positive, lasting impact on public policy. When you run for office, and I, I think if you're in the legislature or you know, city council, whatever you run for, you have a clean slate. You can work on any issues that you feel are important to you. I loved that freedom of saying, you know, I cared about education funding for me. That was, a, that was the reason I ran for office at the beginning. And I actually worked on that for 12 years on a bill that's now starting to get legs now that I'm out. Um, so you can have that kind of um, clean slate. And these are some of the things that I worked in. It's amazing how open and free you can be in, um, when you're deciding public policy. You can really make a difference. And then this was a bill that was on financial literacy that high school kids behind there uh, had brought to me and sponsored and you know with Rich Cunningham in the House when I was in the Senate. And um, it, I'm very proud of that, that now we have trainings in our high schools on how to be more responsible. So politics isn't as scary as it seems. Um, and actually, just when the caterpillar thought the world was over, it became a butterfly. If you want to transform yourself, men and women here, consider running for office. Make our country better. Make our state better. Make your communities better. It's really nice to have a voice, but it's critical to have a vote. Critical to have a vote. You can be an inspiration for positive change. If there's one thing I would love to leave that is, is that with you, is that you yourself, that people can change themselves and they can change things for the better. So I don't know how much time is left. I think we're about up. But do you have time for Q&A, or do you want Q&A? Uh, how much time do you have? 15 minutes. 15? OK, so um, I've covered a lot of things here today. I've covered things like how men and women think differently. Um, you're here because you want to know about your careers. You want to know, you know some information about you know, what would help you in your career. Um, and I have some you know, background with that, if that's helpful. So I'd like to hear from you what you would like uh, to know, if I can help you either in politics or business or gender differences or anything like that. If, if not, while you're thinking, I have a few stories I can tell you. OK. What's your um, name? Do you mind? Yeah, yeah. I'm Ben. Hi, um, Ben. And I think um, the research that you presented at the very beginning um, is extremely substantial. 
in finding that women um, rate higher in so many different professional categories. And I'd be curious to know if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, the criteria and the research methods for that, that survey that was conducted. And, and for example, how did um, respondents determine whether or not male or female was superior in one professional category, for example? So that, that would be a question for Jack Zinger. <laughs> Um, you know, he had a lot of that in his original, but it's so in the weeds that I didn't include it in here. But the sample size was huge, and they do have their highly respected organization on leadership development and consultants. And uh, when I read through them, it, I felt comfortable as a former researcher. I felt comfortable, especially with their large sample, but they, you saw the ones on likability. Those are the kinds of questions that they would do similarly. Um, with, with that. So they ask people like um, people in senior levels, you've worked with a lot of individuals, how would you rate women here, how would you rate men on a variety of different topics. That's how he did it. But if you want more detail, I can certainly send you those slides if you want to give me your contact info. Okay, thank you. I can tell you're a researcher. <laughs> huh? You like, yeah, you like you like cl clean research, sounds like good. Anyone else? How many of you women would like to run for office? How many of you would consider running for office? Raise your hand really high. Okay, what do you want to run for? So I interned last session with Representative Gibson. All right. So I love the house, but that's like a long term goal. Okay, t tell me what you learned. Come up here. Tell me what you learned, um, what you learned from Representative Gibson that made you want to run? Um, Can you hear? Yeah. So I loved, um, while I was interning, I got to sit in on every committee meeting. I got to sit in on different discussions with lobbyists and just really learning um, that politics isn't scary. All of the, um, he heard both sides of the discussions. He learned um, the importance that would come from the decisions he made. Uh, the downfalls that would come from the decisions he made and just how much he loved the people of Mapleton and Springville and everything he did was because he wanted their lives to be better. So I just saw it as a great way to kind of give back and help. But. All right, wonderful. You know, I did throw out right at the beginning kind of how I spoke for you men. Okay, right, remember that part of it? I'd love to hear from you. Do you agree with what I said? Um, is it a scary place not, or an uncomfortable or confusing place right now in, you know, in boardrooms, in, you know, in the workplace? Do you agree with that? I'd love to hear your perspective, especially you young men, which most of you are. Yeah. Um, so I remember um, I got married a year and a half ago, and it was really interesting trying to figure out the appropriate dynamic um, for how to interact with a lot of women on a professional level. Um, I think I've become more comfortable as I've gone along through school, and, and I'm more confident in my relationship with my wife, you know. Um, but I think it's a hard thing. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the points that you made are really valid. So um, just, you know, understanding how to appropriately interact with women in the workplace for the reasons that you stated. One of the things when I bring that up with, uh, you know, with CEOs and their boards is they always want to know what can we do about it. And every organization has its own culture, e everyone. You know, just as an example, the LDS Church formally took the Elevate Her Challenge our first year. Park City, as the city took our Elevate Her Challenge, two completely different culture, right? And so the way that one would um, implement the elevator challenge would be very different than the other. And what I love about the elevator challenge is we're not there overlooking you know, or taking numbers. It's all internal. So what we are telling companies is to have discussions internally and clarify your own rules within your organization. And that seems to be working very well. And it's opening up discussions and dialogue that wasn't there before. Uh, and so I really think that this whole idea of you know, gender, um, and I think also when you look at ethnic too, and generational, there's, there's a lot of barriers in a lot of different ways, but to have an open discussion and clarify the rules within organizations, 
I would say would be one of the most important things that, that organizations can do today. Um, I heard a lot of uh, CEOs tell me when I interviewed them that, you know, they're talking to Sweden one minute and to, um, you know, Africa the next, some country in Africa. And so people are really having to be nimble today. Um, and it's important to have diversity and kind of that, that nimbleness that, uh, that people need. Okay. Um, I'm curious from, so it seems like um, one of the Let's big- Tim stand oh, up. Sure. So it seems, I was, it seems like one of the big challenges for companies is um, being able to help uh, employees like with some of the other responsibilities they have. So you mentioned like, you know, care for its senior family, obviously child care is big. And I've done some work at, at Goldman Sachs and trying to help both men and women employees feel like they can uh, maybe do both without feeling like they're sacrificing, you know, with childcare or with, um, you know, taking care of their parents. So you kind of, you know, mentioned that. I'm curious what other, th what things you see different employers doing yeah. to try to help, you know, all employees feel like they can maybe, you know, manage both of those, you know, effectively. I'll, I'll tell you when I said that I love your generation, all of you are, are young. What I love about it is there, the guilt trips seem fewer today. You know, if someone says, I really need to go to my son's uh, baseball game, Little League baseball game, it's okay. We understand. That's what we want. Um, the olden days were, you feel guilty for that, or maybe you ha all of a sudden get sick when you're really going to the ball game, you know. I mean, it's almost like if you don't work 14 hours a day, 15 hours a day, that there's something to feel guilty for. And I, that's the change that I think is really um, being made right now today in the workplace is that men and women are sharing those responsibilities and they're valuing those family responsibilities. I think that's so healthy. But there are a lot of companies that are realizing that they're having to change benefits and procedures within their company. Um, I, have you heard of Domo? You probably have seen all their signs <laughs> as you drive down I-15. I went and interviewed their um, their HR person not too long ago, and they're giving, uh, now this is kind of interesting in Utah County, but they're giving a $1,000 bonus for any employee that gets pregnant. So, sorry you guys, but, um, you know, but that's, that's one of the things they're doing, and a $2,000 maternity clothing benefit. So, that's, you know, that's just one example that companies are becoming more innovative in, you know, how do we retain people they're really uh, having, a, there's a huge talent shortage right now. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, being able to, you know, get quality talent and keep them there, especially women and men, you know, they're, they're both uh, that important. So we're seeing some very innovative, unique ways of, you know, keeping people in their, their spots. But uh, childcare is huge for women, and uh, a lot of companies are, are doing those sorts of things. The Workers' Compensation Fund is looking at, you know, doing some on-site. There's on-site childcare, but there's also in California, they just went, I think it was Taco Bell, that, you know, they have pretty much a valet. So you can have your work kind of take care of your cleaning. If you have some cleaning that needs to be done, you, someone will come. I mean, it's amazing how companies are adapting to some of the new needs that their employees now have. Um, so there's definitely, um, you know, some changes being made in the workplace. So, any other questions and then I'll... Yes. Um, I had one earlier. My name is Maddie. Um, you mentioned that sometimes you'd be on a board where you're the only woman. Did you ever have a hard time, like, making your perspective or your voice heard? And how did you work with that? Okay, this is kind of interesting. How do you do that if you're the woman? You know, a lot of... I've heard women say, I don't want to be... Um, a, a quota. I don't want to go on this board because I don't want to be a quota. And I always say, be a quota. <laughs> you know, be a quota. So what? You know, because you can have an opportunity to be on a board and show that you can contribute. Um, that comes with confidence. And I think we just recently had a, um, a corporate board training. And Ron Gibson, who's, who just retired as CEO and president of Questar, Dominion Questar, was on the board. He's been on our board for a long time. He's amazing. But he, he talked about the corporate board that, boards that he's on. Some have women and some don't have any women. And he said women are almost always more prepared 
they come prepared. And so I think if, if women and men are prepared, but it just comes, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions and, um, you know, and to be there and to, to do it in a way that doesn't offend people. I mean, I'm a person that I believe you can say something nice, uh, say it nicely, uh, but get your point across. And, and so just do it. And as soon as we don't have to talk about the number of women on boards, that'll be a great day. But what we do find is you need a critical mass, not just one, but there needs to be at least 30% women for women to feel comfortable and really engaging on a board. So it's not just one. And uh, so that's nice to know. Thank you, David. You bet. Thank you, Pat, for, uh, for coming up to Logan. Next time, bring Dan. Yeah, <laughs> OK. She didn't mention, but Dan taught here uh, for 12 years. 12 years, so she's a, you're an Aggie by association. How's yes, that? I did. There you go. I did take some classes up here in Love Utah State. And I love Love Utah State.